I know that I'm not going to get thousands and thousands and thousands of people to go live in the wild. I can't even do it myself. So I need to take those lessons and extrapolate them back. And what it's allowed me to do is sort of form a diet around this idea of wildness as my um, template. So Dan, it's great to finally have you here. I've been following your work for so many years and I appreciate what you bring to the world of nutrition, the wild and the male and the, <laughs> the strength and the power and the humor. I was watching you speaking and just appreciate the aliveness that you imbue. Whatever it is that you're saying, they're just feeling your energy and it's feeding them to be more real, to be more human. How did you come across this? Just talk for a few minutes about the evolution of your thought process. The turning point, though, I guess, was when I got into food. Because that's where it becomes say obvious. More, say more about that. Well, it becomes really obvious really quick that this diet we're eating is essentially the equivalent of what we feed kibble to dogs, right? What we're, we process food for humans is, is like kibble for humans, right? So I grew up on multicolored kibble that you pour milk on. Right, like, and what was your diet growing up, and what's yeah, your diet now? Yeah, so my diet growing up was primarily corn, I assume, right? Corn, soy, cottonseed, beef, you know, this kind of stuff. Trying to work my way back to what a natural diet was was a really interesting process because I thought these things growing, these things in the supermarket, these things in our gardens are natural. I didn't understand. You know, I love to share with people, like, if we went into a supermarket and we, we looked at the produce section, there's really only a couple of species there. It looks like a lot of stuff because there's so many species that are actually pieces of produce that are variants on one species. So a really good example would be the Brassica oleracea. That species is broccoli, but it's also kale, it's also cabbage, it's also kohlrabi, it's also Brussels sprouts, um, it's also rapini. There's all of these expressions, just like different breeds of dogs, but they're all dogs. Most of what's in our produce section looks like a lot of variety, but genetically it's only one thing. So as I started to realize that, I was like, wait a second, what do natural humans actually eat? What I found out is they eat wild foods. Mm -hmm. And when we start to look at that, we find out wild foods are far more nutritious for us, almost exclusively. There's so almost no exceptions to this. So the small wild blueberry compared to the large domesticated blueberry, the large domesticated blueberry just doesn't have as much nutrition in it and not just from the vitamin mineral perspective, but also from the phenol perspective or the antioxidant perspective. Um, this is true of most dom domesticated species. So what I started to do was forage. And that's a challenging thing because you realize pretty fast that the environment's been altered. But there are still a lot of things you can forage and it's a really fun practice. But it also helps you understand, um, because for me as a teacher, I know that I'm not going to get thousands and thousands and thousands of people to go live in the wild. I can't even do it myself. So I need to take those lessons and extrapolate them back. And what it's allowed me to do is sort of form a diet around this idea of wildness as my um, template. So if we kind of imagine a spectrum of for food and we think on one end is, is let's say genetically modified, highly processed food, and on the other end is this idea of wild food that we would forage from nature, foods that would be growing there whether they were humans or not. We can always be moving in this direction Nobody can get over here. I like that about this. I like that because most diets you have the gurus who are the people who will be the most hardcore about the diet and take it to the point of imbalance even, right? But with this, you can't really do it because no one can do it. The best foragers I know, the, the, the wild food guys that I know, right? They can't do it. So they can do it partially. Last message, what can you say to health coaches? Um, man, to the health coaches is that uh, it's important that what you put out there is really based on human biology, that it's in alignment with human biology, that you start to look at your clients like a type of animal, and you're looking at them as an animal saying, what does this animal need to thrive? And it's more than just the food they eat. So remember, you're dealing with an ape, structurally an ape, biologically an ape, and make sure that you're setting up a, syst a, a system for that person that will restore that ape back to rightness, not try to force that ape into another set of dietary dogmas or, or you know, another kind of um, factory farm-like cage. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think with nutrition and definitely with kind of the things I talk about, being an active person, the toughest challenge is getting it from here to rolling. And once it's rolling, it just rolls a lot easier. Uh, and I think that model 
uh, as people act, are more active, they make better exercise choices, they make better food choices, they make just better choices in general. Um, which is why I think you can kind of really change people's behaviors one step at a time and it just has lifelong implications.